Hello, everyone, and sorry about the late start. Welcome to Encryption and You, how the Internet Society community stands up for strong encryption. My name is Austin Ruxtel, and I'm a policy and projects advisor at ISOC, and I'm happy to be here today moderating the session along with Anna. Anna, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. My name is Anna Higgins, and I'm also a project and policy advisor here at ISOC, and I'm also very excited to be here with you all today. So Anna and I are going to be tag team moderating so that you don't get too tired of just listening to me talk the whole way through. So thank you, Anna, for helping. And we're, we just have a few announcements at the beginning uh, to remember to use. We want to remind you all, if you're sharing on social media, uh, use the hashtag Community Week 21 uh, in anything that you post. And also we want to note that interpretation is available right now in French and Spanish. So you can choose the corresponding session entry on the agenda page uh, to join your preferred language. And closed captioning is also available. And if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat and people will uh, give you some technical support on those. And a big thank you to our event sponsor, Amazon, and to Flex Optics, who bring interpretation and captioning to you today. Uh, and a final reminder to all participants, participants to engage respectfully and responsibly. And Anna, I think there are some more for you. Yeah, I have a few more notes. Uh, first is that we encourage everyone to use the chat to share your comments and ask questions. We do ask if you're going to send in a question that you format it with your first name and your country first so we can give you a shout out if we asked your question to our panelists. Um, please also feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat by stating your name and your country. And you can also name one word that comes to your mind when you think of the Internet Society community. And another reminder is that this session is being recorded and the recording is going to be made available on the platform here after the event. So I believe we're ready for our first set of slides. Yes, please. Perfect. So uh, today we're exactly what is encryption and why does it matter? Encryption is the process of scrambling and enciphering data so that it can be read only by someone with the means to return it or decrypt it to its original state. So it is secure data. And more specifically, end-to-end -end encryption is any form of encryption or data in transit in which only the sender and the intended recipient can read the message. So that means that not even the provider or any person in the middle can read the message. You know, if, if it's an app, the app creator can't read the content, only the sender and receiver. So that's really important about end-to-end -end encryption and the Internet Society advocates for protecting this secure technology. And we've got some really great examples from our community today to talk about how people are advocating uh, for to protect it. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Cool. So why is encryption important? Nearly everyone in every sector relies on encryption and many on end-to-end -end encryption. So we've got a big list here of companies, critical infrastructure. So you can think about water and transportation and electric grids, uh, financial systems, especially allowing you to access your banking securely, healthcare with private healthcare information and law enforcement, especially. Um, all are using encryption all the time. And encryption is a vital protection to vulnerable communities like journalists, the LGBT plus community, activists, domestic violence survivors, lots of different marginalized and vulnerable communities really rely on encryption. So we wanna make sure they have that available to them. Next slide, please. And however, unfortunately, encryption is under threat worldwide. So we have a lot of governments and organizations that sometimes attempt to weaken encryption. So they want to change parts of the technology or they want to undermine policies that allow for the use of encryption um, or strong encryption, especially. So they often demand ways for law enforcement, for example, to access end to end encryption. Um, as we call these back doors. So often they'll say, you know, oh, law enforcement wants to be able to do investigations and research and they would be able to do more if they had access to all the content passing between two individuals. Um, and but these are back doors. So no matter what method is used, there's no such thing as a safe backdoor. Criminals can and will discover and use the same way to get in. 
and the bad guys will just use another encrypted service to communicate. So at the end of the day, all back doors are bad ideas. So we really advocate for strong encryption and that's a large part of, of what we're doing on encryption at the Internet Society. And next slide, and Anna. Thank you for that overview, Austin. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk about what we're doing about the threats to encryption here at the Internet Society and with our community. So ISOC, our community and our allies all stand up for strong encryption and we all fight against threats to strong encryption. We do this in a lot of ways, but one of our hallmark efforts is the Global Encryption Coalition that was established last year. It's a collection of organizations and individuals that work together to promote and defend encryption in key countries and in multilateral fora where it's under threat. Last month, the Global Encryption Coalition held its inaugural Global Encryption Day, which many of you participated in and even held events for, and we're very grateful to you all for that. And we had over 70 events worldwide and we reached millions of users through Global Encryption Day. It was a huge success and we have all of you in the community to thank for your help and your support. And what is really important to keep in mind is that community is essential in the fight for strong encryption. If we band together, our collective voice can protect against strong can protect strong encryption from threats. Uh, every voice is vital, no matter how you participate in the ISOC community, whether it's in a chapter, as an organizational member, or as an individual member. We all have something to bring to the table and something to contribute to the promotion and defense of encryption. And here we have a quick roadmap for you all um, of what we're going to discuss today and the names of our wonderful panelists. Um, you can see we just did our short introduction and then we're going to move into a moderated discussion with our panelists. So I think we are good to take these slides down and bring up our panelists. Exactly. So we have a really, really great group of people for you today. This is why you're all here is to hear stories from the community and hear their experience. So we would like to invite each of them to introduce themselves and tell us about how they stand up for encryption and perhaps why and, and the work they do in their area. So we're going to start with Brian Short from Open Media. Hey, thanks, Austin. Um, and thanks to the Internet Society for inviting me here today to talk about the importance of encryption. Um, so I'm based in Canada and I work for an organization called Open Media. We're a grassroots nonprofit organization and we work together with our community to keep the internet affordable, accessible and surveillance free. My primary uh, work is around privacy and there's a lot of connections, of course, to encryption um, with my work in privacy, uh, but it also connects to uh, the work we do around freedom of expression as well. Um, I'll provide a brief overview of kind of the state of encryption in Canada. Uh, be forewarned, it's not uh, too sunny. Um, and then some examples of sort of threats uh, against encryption and some of the work that we're doing at Open Media to uh, fight back and protect uh, the values that, that we enjoy that encryption offers to us. So historically in Canada, um, our position has differed from our Five Eyes coalition partners in the United States, the UK, Australia, New Zealand. Um, as recently as 2017, our public safety minister has had briefing notes and made statements in support of encryption, um, saying that it, it supports some of our fundamental rights and freedoms and uh, provides a public safety element. Um, unfortunately, as recently as 2019 and 2020, that statement has began to change. Um, through pressure, I think, through the Five Eyes Coalition, Canada has created some attacks through um, proposed legislation and consultations on encryption. Um, and most recently in 2020, uh, Canada, uh, along with its Five Eyes partners, released an international statement in which they said, we challenged the assertion that public safety cannot be protected without compromising privacy or cybersecurity. Uh, this is really problematic and flawed logic. Uh, cybersecurity is public safety. I'll repeat that. Cybersecurity is public safety. And we've got a few recent examples in Canada in the last few years demonstrating that. Uh, most recently, just in this year, uh, a few weeks ago, in Newfoundland, our easternmost province, um, 
There was a ransomware attack. We didn't know what it was at first. It was eventually announced that targeted a hospital, a piece of critical public infrastructure, locked down the servers there. Thousands of appointments, procedures were delayed. Um, we're unsure if the ransom was paid, but probably it was. Um, just last year, uh, one of our public universities, Simon Fraser University uh, in Vancouver, Burnaby, um, had a, a, a breach of personal information affecting over 250,000 students, former students, faculty, staff. Um, and then uh, a lab that does, it's a private company, but it works with our public healthcare system, um, had a breach in 2019 that exposed the personal information, sensitive health information of 15 million people. Again, this was a cybersecurity incident and attack. So encryption is public safety, but it's also a means towards secure communication, which in turn facilitates many protected ac activities in Canada, activities protected by our charter of rights and freedom, freedom of expression, thought, association, opinion, belief, and privacy, of course. Um, some examples of uh, threats through government surveillance to this kind of thing. Um, our Canadian Department of National Defense was recently found to be monitoring the social media activity of Black Lives Matter organizers in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Uh, the department claimed they were doing this um, because they were responsible for transporting COVID vaccines. Um, but nonetheless, this is sort of troubling back behavior. And one would wonder if a backdoor into encrypted messaging platforms existed and was accessible to our government, how they might have used this to access more information on these organizers' devices. Um, in 2016, we learned that our federal police force here in Canada um, had access to a global master key through at least 2010 to 2012 for BlackBerry devices, and that they deciphered more than 1 million messages as part of uh, a mafia-related investigation. We only found that out through court documents that were revealed. And we don't know how long that global master key was in the possession of the RCMP, how long they used it, what other investigations it, it could have been used for. Um, and then I'll get to uh, the biggest, most looming threat to encryption in Canada right now is online harms legislation. And we see this in countries all around the world. Um, the government's recently done a very rushed consultation on this, um, and they've promised to introduce legislation within the first 100 days, and they're already 20-ish days into their government. Um, experts um, who have been critical of the process have observed that online harms is not really a legal concept. It's just something that the government has made up. They've bundled together a bunch of different concepts and assigned them false equivalency in, in the process. And the solution that the government is proposing through their online harms technical discussion paper would really hurt the vulnerable communities that Austin pointed out before uh, and that they're claiming to protect through this legislation. Um, we know that machine learning filtering, uh, the kind being discussed by the government, has been shows to have outside negative impacts on these marginalized groups. And this is just one of um, a few ways that the government in Canada is promoting a, a false narrative that they're sort of taking on big tech. Uh, by weakening encryption or by creating reforms to the Broadcasting Act or by creating a link tax. Um, they're, they're saying that they're going to force big tech to play its big share uh, or pay, pay its fair share. But, you know, the best thing the government could be doing to take on big tech in Canada would be to give Canadians real privacy rights through uh, law reform. And it's really unclear how companies that offer end-to-end -end encryption um, can meet the online harms obligations that the government's been talking about. Um, so our work at Open Media and my work um, to protect encryption, uh, we've had a few different campaigns. Most recently, um, we fought back against Apple's proposed changes. We had a campaign called I Surveil um, that, that sought to um, stop Apple from making the changes that they proposed. So along with Fight to the Future and the EFF, we delivered almost 60,000 signatures to Apple. Uh, eventually, they scrapped the parental controls uh, portion of that, and they've delayed seemingly permanently, hopefully, uh, the backdoor that they proposed to create to do client-side screening. Um, we, we promoted uh, the Global Encryption Day and we've uh, been encouraging Canadians to, to make the switch through the uh, ISOC campaign. Uh, we've made a submission to uh, the online harms consultation and we'll be campaigning uh, against that uh, should it actually come out in the first 100 days of government. Um, so that's it for, for my introductory remarks. Um, I'll turn it back. Thanks so much. Excellent, thank you, Brian, I appreciate that. And uh, we'll move on to Luisa now without further ado. 
Thank you. Um, thank you all for having me. Thanks, Isaac, to promote this community week. Um, I'm very excited to be here, both as a member of the Internet Society and the head of ADIS, which is an institute that works very close to the Internet Society uh, Brazil chapter. So it is, is an institute for research on internet and society, a nonprofit research association. And we work with um, several issues between them. We have encryption and as um, and I'm based in Brazil, what takes uh, to my point that uh, the country has been a hotspot for encryption since 2015-2016 when WhatsApp uh, was blocked because uh, it couldn't deliver um, evidence to the, the law enforcement uh, because of encryption. So in Brazil, we, we, we have this discussion very um, very, very hard. And now the cases from the blockades are in our Supreme Court. Um, and the question is, should the providers, uh, or better said, must providers um, have backdoors? Um, so um, how, how could the state authorities have access to uh, our private communication, if they should have this kind of access uh, and how. From now, we have just two votes uh, from our court, uh, but they are um, something that gave us hope because they recognize the importance of encryption for human rights, for freedom of expression, privacy, and personal data protection. So um, we don't have the conclusion of this issue in Brazil, but we are very hopeful um, that it will be recognized uh, if encryption not, uh, not as a right itself, but maybe at least as, um, as, as something uh, essential to other fundamental rights. Um, we also face, like in Canada, a lot of proposals to weaken encryption, um, such as traceability, client sign scanning, and uh, some things that um, now are not being called black backdoors. Um, they are like exceptional um, features or alternative methods uh, to get the uh, private communication content uh, and it's been discussed both at the federal government level and the Congress. Um, and we raised campaigns to promote awareness uh, mainly from for police makers and decision takers uh, in these levels of discussions to show them that it's not a good idea to make exceptions uh, in encryption uh, because the idea is to keep a strong encryption. That's why we also um, joined the Global Encryption Coalition, and we participated a lot in the Global Encryption Day. It was a huge success here in Brazil, too. And um, we tried to produce um, a lot of resources to engage people with the idea that encryption and security and privacy are good things for all of us, not just for a specific group or to meet a specific need, although for some groups and um, and regarding some needs, it, it's even more important. So we recently produced um, a, a study uh, about the perceptions of stakeholders involved in encryption debate. It's available in English, Spanish, and Portuguese uh, for free in our website. And it's very interesting because we map the what is the narrative, what is going on in the debate. And we could uh, find, for example, uh, why people defend and backdoors or the, the, the deeper reasons why these discourses come around. Um, and we also uh, 
uh, had an uh, online course uh, with the funding of Isaac Foundation um, through the Beyond the Net um, program. And it was a huge success. We, we had more than 100 um, applications, which was unexpected because we, we, we thought not a lot of people would be interested in encryption, but uh, it happens that we have a lot of people uh, interested and uh, we decided to put all the content online as well for free for more people to get uh, the the capacity building program and it's available on on youtube uh, with english subtitles so all of you are welcome to know what we have produced uh, and we also play part at uh, national coalition for digital rights where we discuss encryption um, we are part of the latin american and caribbean alliance for encryption the global encryption coalition as i mentioned and also we are hosting a workshop at the internet global forum about encryption and network it uh, and a net um, uh, a trustful network um, and here i will leave this invitation for you to check out the discussions on encryption now around the world that we will promote at IGF as well. So basically this is what we are doing to, to strengthen encryption, but for sure there is a lot more to be done. <laughs> Absolutely, I I appreciate that, Lisa. Definitely, always more advocacy needed, and and all over the world as well from all of our communities. So now we will move on to our last presentation from Michelle before we go into um, some question and answers from the audience. Perfect. Thank you very much, Austin. I have some slides. I don't know if they are. Oh yes, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Michelle. Uh, I'm from Derechos Digitales, uh, that is an um, NGO from Chile, but actually I am from Brazil. And I would like to give you uh, a, a presentation. Um, I don't know if it's working, the slides, but it should be. Oh, yes. Uh, and and let, I'd like to talk what we are doing in, and talk about uh, encryption, human rights, and what's happening here in Latin America. And I'm going to talk just uh, this context about human rights and cases, and I would like to have some thoughts about advocacy to protect encryption. So in a perspective uh, in Latin America, we have like um, the protection of the underlying fundamental rights human rights that are involved um, with with encryption for example privacy freedom of expression uh, freedom of thought life economic and social cultural rights a lot of human rights that are involved but we don't have encryption protection uh, and security requirements in this law in these laws but we have the mention uh, about integrity and secret of communications and, and this uh, secret of communications is like an uh, interpretation that is always in transit communication, not the communication that like uh, like is, is still in the in some places in the, the phone and in, in some uh, uh, the communication that is stopped. Uh, if we can say so this is the general uh, the general view we have some specific cases like uh, in in Cuba laws that uh, um, says that we have previous per permission to have encryptions laws in Colombia that says that uh, prohibition of the encryption in some specific cases but this law is not so clear and we have some cases like El Salvador and Ecuador uh, that says that there is an obligation to assist authorities uh, to the encrypt. Uh, but we do have some cases and some narratives and practices that are contrary to, to encryption. We have, for example, hacking team and NSO group hiring equipment like to security vulnerability to evade encryption. We have the Brazilian, 
the Brazilian case that uh, Luisa already told us perfectly what's happening in the in our Supreme Court with two votes now, uh, a case from 2015 that had a public hearing that people were there, uh, WhatsApp and, and uh, civil society and other people were there explaining to the judges what's, what's encryption and why this is important. We have the, in Chile, we have two cases, the Operation Huracan with a false narrative about encryption and things like this. And we have a bill that was being discussed to, to, to put the use of encryption as an aggravant of uh, a crime. Uh, besides that, um, we would like to express some places to do advocacy and to promote encryption together with places and, and actions that we here in the Reches Italis we are doing and that we did in the several uh, months and years. Uh, we have different places to, to, to look at, like in the international level, we have the Human Rights uh, Council, for example, the, the resolution 48 for in the last month uh, that talks about privacy in the digital area, that talks about uh, encryption expressly. Um, we also have special report, reports. We have the Human Rights Committee interpreting the ICCPR. We have the first committee of the UNGA about disarmament and international security. We have now this cybercrime convention that's being discussed uh, for this ad hoc committee that the first meeting is going to happen now in January uh, in, in New York. And we think that these are places that we can uh, also to engage in like an advocacy to, to, to protect encryption. Uh, we also have like in uh, international advocacy, but looking in a regional perspective, we have this American, inter-American system of human rights and the, the repertoires, for example, freedom of expression, Pedro Vaca and other repertoires that are important to, to protect encryption. Uh, we have these economic and commercial diplomacy like country meetings, G20, G7, and also free trade agreements that we can also uh, have advocacy in these agreements and, and, and these discussions. And we think that in, in the national level, we have Regulations like digital agenda, cybersecurity policies, personal data protection, cybercrime regulations, criminal uh, intelligence investigation, investigation, and also these crude cases like the one that uh, Lisa told us that are very important to, to have civil society and, and other players uh, ex explaining what is encryption and saying why this is important. Um, and I would like just to finish uh, my presentation showing some examples of what we are doing. We produced this uh, report about anonymity encryption, uh, looking at the Chilean uh, case, but also looking at a regional perspective. And we have blog posts uh, in, our, in our website, and we do uh, participate in the Global Encryption Coalition also, and the Alliance for Latin American and Caribbean that was just launched. And that's it. We are very happy with this conversation. And Anna and Austin, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, for uh, explaining your work in encryption and, and why it matters. So uh, I did see one question in the chat, I believe. I'm, I don't remember who it was from, but it was asking sort of, how do you capture people's hearts when talking about encryption? So I know that we are, you know, you are a community, a lot of you work for NGOs and, and you're reaching out to other communities, but also policymakers. So how do you really get your, how do you get that heart feeling involved when you're, when you're explaining your work in encryption? So maybe we'll do another quick round, just maybe one or two minutes each, because we've only got 10 minutes left of the session. Um, and we'll just start with Ryan again and go through. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, it's 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 difficult. I'll say that to there, there is um, there was a survey done in Canada, and I think this uh, transcends Canada. This is a, a global issue. People don't understand what encryption is, and I'm not just talking about ordinary people. I think judges and lawmakers uh, fail often to understand what encryption is and why it is so important. 
So in my work, when we're talking about encryption and we're communicating it, the idea of it to people, we have to relate it to stuff that they're doing in their ordinary everyday lives. Um, we are in a global pandemic right now. A lot of our lives turned online uh, early on and we access services digitally that we would have um, gone to see somebody in the real world, world for. It could be financial services, it could be health related services. And the only thing that's protecting our information as we engage through these you know, formally um, in real world um, relationships now digitally is encryption. So if that's your health data, your financial data, um, stressing that and impressing upon people that this is sort of the, the last line of defense between these essential um, pieces of information and uh, potential harms and dangers coming to you. So uh, yeah, short answer is, uh, yeah, relating, making it relatable, making it accessible as best we can. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, we, we must uh, create awareness on how important encryption is in a daily basis. Um, but uh, there are some practical cases that brings attention to the discussion and the importance of encryption. We heard some cases uh, on uh, security incidents in Canada. It happens in Brazil, for example, last year, that it was an incident in the superior Court of Justice and the whole country stood five days without the, ju ju the judicial system. I mean, everything was down. Uh, and so this shows how important we, we, it is to keep the highest standards possible for uh, securing our information and, and, and encryption meets these uh, highest standards. Um, so there is this uh, this practical dimension. Um, also, we faced last year the the largest uh, data breach in Brazil. Um, 220 million of people have their data um, leaked. So basically, if you were alive uh, in 2020 in Brazil, probably your data uh, was leaked as well, and it was the, the the most rational assumption that we all had our data leaked, and it would not have happened if we were a country that invests in things like encryption and not invest time in and efforts to weakening encryption. Uh, but at a more subject uh, level, I think if from the information security perspective, encryption is almost a baseline. I mean, we need it for essential uh, life services uh, and institutional services. Um, for some of us in our society, it's not just the baseline, but it's also the lifeline. Um, and we, we must say, and, and we must recognize that there are people out there that just survive because they have their communications encrypted and people who suffer from um, any kind of threats or violence, especially in a country super violent as Brazil, uh, against women, against minorities, um, against uh, including the law enforcement agents. We have uh, uh, very worry numbers of crimes against law enforcement and it would be really worse if we do not have our communications encryption. So sometimes we also need to embrace this dimension that we are talking about people's lives. And this is a message that we really want to, to, to carry. Yeah, Michel, what, what do you think? Oh, thank you very much, Austin. Well, I think that uh, Luisa and Brian uh, just uh, got very good points about how difficult it is to talk about encryption and, and how difficult it is to talk with different audiences. I think that this is one of the, uh, one of the most uh, important things that we have to, to understand because different audiences, they, they have like different uh, perspectives but they have also different uh, objectives that they want to pursue. And, and this is important to, to also talk their language 
and and show the the risks that are involved. Brian and, and Luisa told the risks that are involved are, are very very high. Like uh, we are talking about human lives here. We are talking about uh, the infrastructure of uh, the country. Like the, we are talking about uh, all of the courts that are in the all the cases that are in courts, for example. We are talking about a lot of things. So this is very difficult, but we have to like also say the good things about it. I mean, the the, the good, the the bright side of the the, the encryption. I, I think we have to focus also because we are talking about security. We are, we are talking about liberty. We are, we are talking about privacy. Uh, we are talking about uh, daily things. It's not uh, a super. Uh, difficult uh, question, like we are talking about our lives, but we have to, to express how this is important. And we would like to stress the importance, importance always to talk about encryption and human rights, because we have human rights that are already set and, and we have privacy, we have freedom of expression, we have all these uh, literature and, and conventions and all, everything about it. And we have to place encryption together with human rights because encryption is essential for the protection of human rights. Uh, encryption is essential for vulnerable communities, for journalists, for a lot of people. And I think this is difficult, how to, we talk with different people, with different audiences, with different uh, objectives, uh, institutional objectives also, and how we do it in a, in a simple way. Like this is not very, very complicated. We have to do like a simple talk to people in order they can understand this is very, very important to the life. And that's it, Anna and Austin. Great, thank you all for those insights. Uh, we have only three minutes left, so I'm going to ask our panelists if you have a single recommendation or piece of advice that you'd like to pass on to our community. We're going to do a quick lightning round. Brian, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. Um, I think it's just to underscore the importance of encryption as being an essential sort of um, yeah last line of defense. Um, Louisa said it well when she said like this is it's not just, um, you know, it, it is our infrastructure and stuff, but it's also human lives are at stake and people depend upon this um, to do important work to, to defend the essential rights and freedoms that we have. Um, and without encryption, that, that work becomes much more difficult, if not in, impossible to do. Um, so yeah, I'll keep it short. Thank you, Brian. Louisa? Yeah. Um, thank you again for this opportunity, and I think we must go forward and uh, um, fight for the strong encryption and fight for the rights it's, it protects. So um, this kind of initiative is also what we need to do more, to listen to each other and to find straight strength among each other too. Thank you. And I'm going to pass the last word to Michelle. Yes, to be very short, I think that we have to stress that encryption is the exercise of rights and encryption is a guarantee of rights. And we, we do have to promote it in order to protect the, the human rights that we already have. And, and it's a pleasure to be in this panel. It's a uh, thank you very much for this invitation and we continue in the advocacy in this very, very different fora that we have to advocacy and we are available for future engagements. Thank you. Amazing. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. We really appreciate you having you all here today. I'd also like to extend a thank you to our sponsors, Amazon and Flex Optics for their continued support of Community Week. Um, and I'd also like to extend a thank you to our exhibitors in the booths. And above all, thank you to you all, our community, for attending our Community Week. We really appreciate your time and your participation and your continued support. 
And we also ask that uh, when the post event survey is sent out to you that you fill it out, we would love to hear your feedback and improve this event for next year. So thank you so much, everyone. Um, and we're going to end the session now. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.